Hi everyone and a warm welcome to this new YouTube series which I've titled World Model LAS from Theoretical Foundations to Simulation Setup. In varying degree of intensity I've been working with wall modeling for about seven years now and since a while back I wanted to make a YouTube series like that but it's only now that I've really got the time and the energy to do it so I'm really excited about it. Okay let's dive in by looking at the uh, contents of the whole video series. Uh, so in this introductory video, our goal is really going to be to define what wall model LAS really is. And in order to do that, we're going to have to briefly review the structure of turbulent boundary layers. With a definition in place, we're going to get a bird's eye overview of wall model LAS approaches. And we'll find that the two main classes are wall stress modeling and hybrid LAS RANS. We'll continue with looking more in detail at what wall stress modeling is, and in particular how it fits in the integrated LES equations and how the wall shear stress arises as a natural boundary condition. We'll then look at the different wall stress modeling approaches that exist, and we'll see that they can be neatly arranged in a complexity hierarchy based on the underlying equations. With all of this theory in our hands, we'll be <clears throat> then looking at some practical aspects and here the meshing strategy will be probably the main thing we are going to be looking at uh, but also things like numerics and subgrid scale modeling for example. We'll also look at some concrete simulations which uh, I've done in the past in order to get a more hands-on feeling for how a wall model LES simulation looks. Finally we'll continue with the last part, which will be conducting wall model LES with open foam and the library that uh, together with colleagues we've created uh, some years back called lib wall model LES. And here we'll go through the standard parts uh, of um, how to use a particular software, that is how to install it and then how to set up the case uh, and basically of what uh, functionality is being offered. Okay, so what are the prerequisites for understanding the material in this uh, series of videos? Basically, my goal is that the target audience should be all CFD practitioners. Uh, I would say if you're a graduate student and you took a course in turbulence modeling, you should be good to go. If you're a CFD engineer working with turbulent flows, you should be good to go. And of course, if you are a <clears throat> CFD researcher uh, in the topic of turbulence or probably just CFD in general, really, uh, you are definitely have enough knowledge to follow along. Uh, so I've, I've prepared sort of some bullets of what is expected. So it's general knowledge of basic terminal modeling concepts, like what is RANS, what is LES, uh, what is eddy viscosity, just basic things like that. Uh, then the second bullet is familiarity with the finite volume method. Um, and that is because we are really going to focus on this particular discretization method in this series, uh, even though, of course, well, model LES can be applied uh, also to finite differences or finite elements or your other favorite method. Uh, the motivation for a finite volumes here is, well, honestly, because I've been working with them uh, during my whole research career and also because they are still by far the most popular approach when it comes to general purpose codes. So open foam, fluent, star CCM, CFX, gold Saturn, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, All of them use finite volume methods. So it does make sense to um, focus on them. Finally, for the last part where we're going to look at how to use open foam with uh, our library to conduct all model LES, I expect you to already be familiar with open foam in general. So I'm not going to go through how to set up an open foam case and things like that. Uh, we're going to focus solely on the wall modeling aspect. Okay, before we continue with the material, um, I would like to give you some literature, uh, which you can read along with, uh, with the video series in case you want to do that. Um, so the first reference here is by Larson and colleagues, and this is a review paper of Wall Model LES, and it's a really great paper. I highly recommend it. Uh, I think this is the best review paper of on the topic to date, honestly. Uh, there is another review paper uh, here from 2018 by Bose and Park, 
Uh, so it's a little bit more recent uh, and it takes on a, well, it's a bit of a different angle compared to the Larson paper. So that's also recommended. Um, finally, the last two references are to my work and mine together with colleagues. And the reason for that is that obviously uh, th in these two are going to follow more closely uh, with the narrative presented in the in the YouTube um, in the YouTube series. So the first one is basically my PhD thesis, and here chapter five is dedicated to wall modeling. And uh, the last one is a technical report which we've written just to summarize how the wall model is formulated uh, in the case of collocated finite volume discretization framework, which is used in OpenFOAM. Uh, so this, this is a really easy read, uh, but it, it covers all, all the components of wall modeling. So uh, also recommended. Okay, so as I said, in order to understand wall modeling, we need to review the structure of turbulent boundary layers. And the reason for that really is because all the hybrid turbulence modeling approaches, which somehow blend LES with something else, uh, are conveniently defined in terms of uh, velocity profile and the turbulent structures inside turbulent boundary layers uh, over flat walls usually. Uh, so what we have here on the left side is the mean velocity profile inside a turbulent boundary layer. And this profile can be split into two overlapping regions called the inner region and the outer region. So here the outer region is this whole big yellow almost square here. And the little pink rectangle, the much smaller one, is the inner region. And the orange one is where they overlap. So actually the inner region is up to here, but it also overlaps with the outer region forming the overlap. Uh, so what is the difference between the inner and the outer region? Um, the difference really is uh, in terms of uh, associated sets of length scales and velocity scales, which uh, describe the flow. So in the outer layer, the relevant length scales is the free stream velocity called capital U and the thickness of the boundary layer delta as of a length scale. Uh, so what you notice here is that viscosity is not a part of these scales. Uh, and that is sort of a physical definition of the outer layer that viscosity does not play a role in the physics. Now, by contrast, in the inner layer, uh, viscosity plays a major role and uh, it goes into the definition of uh, viscous length scale, delta nu, um, which is defined as viscosity over this u tau, which in a turn is the relevant velocity scale. Now u tau, it's called the friction velocity, is defined through the wall shear stress, uh, tau wall, which is also gonna be a very, very important uh, quantity for this whole uh, YouTube series. Uh, but wall shear stress is basically the shear stress at the wall, as the name implies, uh, and it corresponds to the friction force uh, at the wall. So really in the inner layer, I would say the, the, the main physical parameters are tau wall and nu, and then we just use dimensional analysis in order to derive a velocity uh, and length scale as we've done also in the outer layer. So when we want to look at the velocity profile close to the wall, it's quite common that uh, we adopt a semi-logarithmic plot, uh, which is seen here. And then on the, on the x-axis, we normalize the wall normal distance y with this viscous length scale delta nu, and then apply a log. Uh, on the other hand, for the y-axis, we divide the velocity or the mean velocity by the friction velocity, u tau, and get what is called u plus. Uh, and since the log scale conveniently magnifies the region close to the wall, we are in a position to look at its form in a bit more detail. And in particular, the most interesting aspect is that uh, there is a region called the log law region uh, in which the velocity profile in this log scaling adopts basically a linear profile. Uh, Basically, the log law region overlaps with the 
overlap region, sorry for the tautology. And I would say that the two concepts are more or less interchangeable. Uh, but for example, if you look at the, this diagram here, which I've taken from uh, Pope's Turbulent Flows, uh, we can see that the overlap region is considered to be a little bit less than the Loglar region, which extends a bit beyond it. And it actually sort of corresponds to what we have in the picture. I guess the Loglar extends a little bit beyond the, the overlap region. But as I said, they, they, can, they are more or less used interchangeably. So one subtle thing which I want to focus on is that the inner layer is defined from the wall to about 0.1 of the boundary layer thickness. So the upper boundary of the inner layer is in fact defined in outer coordinates. Okay, now the value 0.1 is approximate. In other literature, you will see, for example, 0.2. So all of these numbers in this diagram, I would say, are a little bit approximate. But the important point is that the upper boundary of the inner layer is defined in outer coordinates. On the other hand, if we look at the outer layer, the lower bound is defined in inner coordinates. Okay, so here it starts from y plus 50. Um, so that can be good to remember in the future. So there's a reason why I mentioned it and we'll, we'll see it later. Uh, now, what is the theory behind the sort of interaction between these inner and outer layers? I'm not like uh, completely on top of all the theory which is produced on the topic and it is still a research topic. Uh, I don't think we've yet settled on a full understanding of how um, all the eddies and possible structures interact to form this flow. Uh, but basically it goes like this. I think the classical theory is that there are two completely independent systems. So the inner layer lives its own life and the outer layer lives its own life and then they sort of asymptotically converge to the same thing in the overlap region. A more modern view, I believe, is that the outer layer is fairly independent. However, the events in the outer layer modulate what happens in the inner layer. So there's a more or less unidirectional connection between the physics in the outer layer and the inner layer. These peculiarities are not going to be particularly important for us. Uh, and of course, you can find much more details in the literature, uh, but it may be good to remember. Finally, I want you to note that the ratio of delta to delta nu forms a Reynolds number, uh, which is called the friction Reynolds, <coughs> friction Reynolds number, excuse me, and we call it Reynolds tau. Having reviewed the theory of TBLs, let us now ask perhaps the most important question of the video. Why do we even need wall modeling? So why can't we simply do conventional LES uh, all the way down to the wall? So the problem is that this inner layer, which we have seen is very, very thin, is nevertheless very dynamically important. In particular, if you look at such a quantity as the mean turbulent kinetic energy K, then we'll see that we have a peak in the inner layer, in particular at y plus equal to 12, so very close to the wall. So for turbulent boundary layers, LES really becomes sort of a misnomer because the eddies we need to resolve are not really large anymore, but rather they're on this scale of delta nu, which is very, very small. Recall that we've shown that the ratio of delta and delta nu forms a Reynolds number. Now let's think a little bit more about what that means. So as a boundary layer develops on, for example, a flat plate, its thickness grows, so delta goes up, and of course the Reynolds number also goes up, so both of these quantities go up. Now what that means is that delta nu cannot grow faster than delta, because in that case Reynolds tau would go down. And in fact delta nu grows just like delta, but it grows slower than delta. And what that means is that if we, if we take out a volume of size delta cube, so just a cube of a size delta, 
Then, as the Reynolds number grows, the relative thickness of the inner layer will become smaller and smaller and smaller. And that means that we'll have to throw more and more and more resources into resolving this delta nu compared to resolving delta and resolving the rest of the flow. And this is really what constitutes the problem. There are associated grid size estimates of how, how much well, let's say grid cells or grid nodes, depending on your discretization framework, you need to have in order to uh, resolve all the, all the relevant scales and how it scales, well, scales with the Reynolds number. And uh, the estimate is that it's Reynolds number to the power 1.85, so almost quadratic scaling. And this is the issue, because we are interested in very high Reynolds number flows in industry typically, so we're really interested in methods which would allow us to compute uh, these Reynolds, high Reynolds number flows. And unfortunately, it's pretty easy to see that, for example, if our Reynolds number is 10 to the power, let's say seven, then the grid size is of order 10 to the power almost 14, which is outside of our capabilities right now, and probably in the near future at least. And 10 to the power seven isn't even the largest Reynolds number we want to consider. So this is the issue. And the figure we have here below, which I've taken from the paper by Larson and colleagues, is basically an illustration of what I just said regarding the scaling. So on the x-axis here, we have the Reynolds number, both Reynolds tau and as an alternative Reynolds theta. And on the y-axis, we have the number of cells we have in this delta cube volume. So the first, vol uh, sorry, the first line, the blue one, shows the amount of cells we have to throw into discretizing the outer layer. And that stays independent of the Reynolds number because we simply decide beforehand how many cells we want to discretize the length scale delta with, and then by cubing that we get this number. And this remains constant. The next two lines, uh, on the other hand, show how uh, the number of cells scales in the discretization of the viscous layer and the overlap layer. And that's basically just a split of the inner layer, right? So if we sum these two together, we get the inner layer. And here we see the unfortunate scaling, which I've been talking about, which overall then leads and is responsible for this Reynolds, to the power, Reynolds number to the power 8.85. All right, now we're finally in the position to define what wall model del ES is. And of course, it's connected to what we have just discussed and the fact that we don't want to resolve those turbulent motions on the scale of delta nu. So here's the definition. In wall model del ES, turbulent motions in the inner layer are modeled, whereas other turbulent motions are resolved as in a conventional LES. So if we look at our scales for the turbulent boundary layer, as we said, those on the scale of delta nu are modeled, but we are committed to resolving the outer layer properly, so all the scales um, of size delta are in fact supposed to be resolved well. So if we look now what happens in terms of scaling for our flat plate TBL, we see that the estimate is now a linear dependency of the grid size on the Reynolds number, which is of course much better than the nearly quadratic one we had for the conventional or world resolved LES. Uh, the ratio of uh, costs between conventional or as I said, well resolved LES and well modeled LES is depicted on uh, this diagram from taken also from Larson et al. And uh, we see that, uh, of course, very, very fast with the growth of a Reynolds number, uh, well resolved LES becomes much, much, much uh, more expensive. So for 10 to the power 4, it's already several hundred times more expensive to run well resolved than well modeled. That being said, I want to point out that wall modeled LES is still an expensive turbulence modeling method. Uh, of course, it's cheaper than the wall resolved version, but it's still expensive. And the reason is that we are committed to resolving the outer scales in the turbulent boundary layer. So that's basically the reason why wall modeled LES hasn't seen such a widespread approach in the industry yet, but likely that is going to change in the nearest decade. And we can already see that from the literature. Uh, yeah, so this is going to be the end of this first video. I hope you enjoyed it. In the next video, we're going to look at the different classes of wall model LES approaches that are out there. Stay tuned.